thank you very much for that introduction. Jay, I'm very pleased and slightly terrified to be talking to you all this afternoon about the work I've been doing over the last year, basically. So yeah, my name's Andrew, and I've been programming in Racket for about uh, two and a half years after being introduced to it during my undergrad, which I just finished up at the University of Toronto. And yeah, this was a project that I thought of basically immediately after encountering Racket, and I tried out a couple of false starts with it before actually really getting it going in September of last year, and uh, let me show you the results of my efforts. So aspirationally speaking, Fructure is an engine for structured interaction. And I'm not gonna be talking that much about what I mean by that. That's a very kind of general goal, but what I have to show you today is a uh, specific application of Fructure, if you will, which is a prototype structured editor for racket code. And if you haven't heard the term structured editor before, it, there's a lot of different variations on the concept, but the basic idea is that all actions in the editor preserve syntactic well-formedness. So you can't actually make, make a syntactic mistake within the editor itself. I think that this description is underselling a little bit what structured editing is about, but I'll let you guys be the judge. Uh, so this is something you can download now. It's fairly minimal. It's, it, it supports only a very limited subset of the, uh, the Racket language. But I think you, playing around with it really does a good job of illustrating kind of what I hope to uh, build and achieve. And one other thing I wanted to mention, because I'm going to jump in right after this with a demo, is that this is designed from the ground up with straight, for straightforward extensibility. Like, I would like it to make it as seamless as possible for you to take your lang and to make structured editing work for you in the way you want to. Most of this functionality isn't implemented yet, but uh, yeah, I mean, I've learned a lot this week at the Racket School about language-oriented programming, and I'm hoping to leverage that to, uh, to make that work for, for me and for you as well. So I'm gonna jump right to a demo. This is Fructure. It's what you see. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, what you see in front of you here, the yellow thing is a hole. The hole is a kind of placeholder, if you're not familiar with holes in a programming context, it's going to be filled with something, in this case, a program. The red thing around the hole is a cursor or a selector. I'm going to press enter to switch to transformation mode. And yeah, this is a modal editor. I know that's controversial uh, amongst some people. One thing my editor does, it's, it screams what mode you're in. So I press enter and you see all of this red this red means transformation mode. If you see a bunch of red and that white arrow, transformation mode is what you're in. So what's popped up here right now is on the left-hand side of the white arrow, you see my original hole, and on the right-hand side, there's this menu. This menu has a variety of syntactic forms. There's, yeah, a bunch of basic things like defines, lambdas, ifs, begins, You've got some literals, some zeros, some ones, some trues, some falses, and some functions from a basic library, mostly Boolean functions, list functions, and numerical ones. Now, the most basic thing you can do in Fructure, and I'm gonna start out slowly here, is pick a particular form, like let's pick a begin here, press enter, and now you'll notice that original hole has been replaced by this begin. I'm back in navigation mode now, and I can use the arrows to move around, and they move in a little pre-order traversal of this tree. Can't really tell much because the tree is not very big right now. If I select this hole in the begin and press enter, back to transformation mode, I can select another form like this if here, press enter again, now that's part of the tree. And again, I can move around in a pre-order traversal, I can select another hole, I can insert a begin, you notice, yeah, after I get above a certain length, there's a line break happening. And yeah, you know, this is kind of cool, like I can put together a program in this way and I'm certainly not gonna make any syntax mistakes but it's probably not the most compelling entry mechanism in the world, probably not the most efficient one either. Let's see if we can improve the situation somewhat. First, I'm gonna delete what I have. So I've selected the whole tree here, and if I press enter again, you notice I have the option of replacing this with exactly one thing, a hole. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Here I am, back to the hole. I'm gonna press enter, and this time, when I go down to a form, let's pick a begin again, I'm going to press right to step into this form. And I call this mode walking the grammar. It's kind of a submode of transform that makes it a little bit easier to enter stuff more rapidly. Again, I can step right, I can step right, and I can keep on building up a program in a slightly more efficient way. But let's say I want it to do something like actually enter an identifier. This is a program, we want some names beyond what we're given initially. I'm gonna step into this lambda here and you notice it works in basically the same way. The menu has shrunk to a single character, 
but I can go down and I can pick some characters. Some might say this form of entry is also bad, <laughs> but let me show you one little feature here. Now that I've typed that bad here, bad becomes an option in my list, which is probably not a compelling feature to many people, but for those of you who use Dr. Racket, it's probably nice to get some actual auto-completion. Um, and I also, just for the sake of fun, added a few more things in this menu. I can pick some emojis. I wanna throw up some uh, fingers and some kissy faces. They're all in the menu here. Again, this isn't necessarily a terribly compelling mechanism of entry, though I think you can envisage how this menu-based thing might be useful in some educational context. You notice I've left a lot of space around everything here. Part of the reason of having these holes and like this, this red thing is they provide hooks for perhaps a touch interface. But, and this is one thing I think a lot of structure editors have fallen down on. A lot of them after this point, they'll say, oh, if you want to insert forms quickly, you can use form-specific keyboard shortcuts. Whereas, my preferred alternative is simply to type normally. And what's happening here as I type is I've turned insertion into a search problem. Oh, and I'll show you, I've got this undo thing. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not really adept at live coding, so I'll probably make a lot of mistakes. I, I, I like making my keyboard shortcuts more spatial. For example, my undo is simply pressing left. I don't know whether you guys can see at the top, there's a list of everything I'm pressing, but it's not particularly important that you see what I'm doing. But the point is, I can go left, 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 undo, and then if I decide I actually want what I did, I just press right, right, right to restore what I, to restore what I had before. But let me actually finish writing this little program here. Uh, if, uh, let's say, empty xs, then zero, otherwise I would add one to length, of rest excess. And yeah, there's a little program. And you'll notice, yeah, it prevented me from making syntax errors. And there's a few fun little features here that, yeah, because you can't see those, those characters above, you might not have noticed. I actually didn't have to type any parentheses. And that's not something that's in general true of my editor. But if the grammar, the particular subset of the grammar you're using is sufficiently unambiguous that parentheses are unnecessary, then you simply don't have to type them. So I've written a little program here. And I can use the arrow keys again to navigate in a pre-order traversal of the tree. And let me show you, like, sure, writing a program, that's cool, I guess. But one of the things I wanted to accomplish in a structured editing context is editing in a way that I find is more compelling than, 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 than the standard approach. And we'll start again slow here. Uh, I have the feature to paint areas of the syntax pretty colors. For example, there I've painted that empty, and here I've painted that add. And if you're like me, you'll be like, okay, clearly that's sufficient. Like, this feature needs no additional justification. It's, it's, it's simply a joy in and of itself. But no, there's actually a reason for this. And the most simple way you can use this is as a, a, a simple copy-paste mechanism. Like, I'm gonna go up, I'm gonna select this whole define. I'm gonna paint it blue, and I'm gonna press enter to go to transformation mode. This time, instead of selecting that hole, I'm gonna step into it. And now I've got everything that can fit in that hole in my menu. The menu down here is exactly what you saw before, but up at the top, everything that I've painted, which is just this blue thing at the moment, also shows up as an option. I'm gonna start typing begin, because I'm gonna nest that thing in a begin. I'm gonna step into the first hole and stick that define in there. Then I'm gonna stick a hole at the bottom. Now, if I click enter on this hole to go back to transform, you notice I can just type in length, because now length is in scope. I can stick in a list literal. And there, again, is a little program. So that's cool. Uh, but what the point of that painting mode is, is to do more complex destructuring. Like, for example, this if up here. What if I wanted to do something slightly more interesting with it? Like, let's paint this, paint this, paint this. Select the if, press enter, step into the hole. I'm gonna start typing cond, advance to the first hole, stick the empty in there, stick the zero in here, pick an else, stick the add in there. Press enter, and I've turned that if into a con, just like that. So please notice that this wasn't a built-in feature, like that was just, I, I destructured and restructured on the fly. But for simple things, like turning cons into ifs, and vice versa, like you just build that in. Like for example, I built it in the opposite direction to show you if I click enter on that cond, not only do I have the option to delete it, I have the option to turn it into an if. 
And in general, this is my editing approach with transformation-based editing, is I'd like to, to, to put a lot of these simple macros or simple transformation rules into a, a default library so that when you click on a particular piece of syntax, you'll get this list that kind of represents the adjacent possible of what this thing can turn into. And as opposed to like looking through a list of refactorings, you look at what this will turn that particular piece of code into in a context-sensitive way. Anyway, let's just go through and do that transformation here. And I've already shown you most of what I've implemented already, but there's a few other little fun things I'll show you just for convenience, more or less. I'm gonna delete this zero here and bring up the menu. And again, like as I mentioned, I like these spatially aware keyboard shortcuts. So one thing you can do here is if this menu is too small, you can press shift down, make it bigger, see a little bit more. If you think that menu is covering up stuff you might otherwise like to see, you can shrink the menu. In fact, you can shrink it to a single character. And shrink to a single character like that, I mean, it really feels like conventional text entry with autocomplete, which is what some people prefer. Also, if you wanna get rid of the transformation there, like get rid of that white arrow thing, which is not particularly interesting when there's just a hole there, you can press shift left, shift right, shift left, shift right, to get rid of it. Anyway, there's a lot of customizability like that built into this thing. And one other thing I'd like to show you before I switch to my slides is I have built in the ability to switch a lot of options on the fly simply by pressing space and scrolling through this list of options here. For example, you can change the font. I've got some inbuilt ones here, but you're welcome to use whatever you want. Some of these are less compelling than others. Uh, you can change, oh yeah, this is like, slightly hacky, but you, you, you can make function applications explicit, if you will. This is just basically to show off there's a full projectional layout engine under here, so there's a lot of annotated information in the syntax tree that you can choose to display or not. Uh, there's holes. They're just displayed as circles, but if you want, I can show you the sort, the grammatical sort of the thing that fits in in that hole. This is not necessarily particularly interesting, but if you move to a typed context, I think it becomes much more interesting, and I'm planning on building out a type system for type langs. Also, uh, if you define functions, I could do things like when you start writing a function, the parameter names from the function definition would be inserted instead of the holes. You've got options. Uh, you can change the outline block width, or you can get rid of them entirely if you really hate parentheses. Um, don't think anybody here falls into that category, but you never know. Different things, different graphical options, like those little background colors, you can change those. Uh, let's see what else I got here. Oh yeah, you can change the padding. You got a whole bunch of options here. Uh, text size, if you know. I, I was contemplating picking a really low one to start out with and wowing you with the text size change, but I decided probably not a good move. Uh, if you don't like these rounded corners, you can also get rid of those, make everything kind of squarish. Or if you really like the rounded corners, you can just go nuts. <laughs> just absolutely crazy. Not necessarily recommended. I might put a limiter on that for release, but not right now. Oh, and so my layout engine is quite simple right now. I'm eventually hoping to move to a constraint-based layout system. Right now, each form just has a cutoff. If a, if a particular syntactic form gets beyond a certain length, it's pushed down to the next line, but I can change that. Push it up to one line, push it down to a really thin program. You got options. So that's structure so far. Thank you very much. That went a little bit longer than I, I, I wanted it to, so I'm probably not going to have time to make it through all these slides, but let me tell you a few things. So Fructure originally stood for Functional Reactive Structure Editor. Uh, this is not entirely accurate with how things turned out. It is functional. In fact, everything you just saw is a Big Bang program. The whole thing is just a Big Bang program. All of the graphics are via the image teach pack, which, yeah, exactly. I think it's a great testament to the, uh, the architecture you guys have created here. Um, and I mean, surprisingly, there, there's few limitations I've actually run into. I probably won't want to use it forever, but there's still features that, that, that I could use that I, I'm not. Uh, so I named it this, and about six months later, I actually Googled it, and it turns out it's a real word. <laughs> it's an obsolete noun, meaning use, fruition, or enjoyment, and I think this is much more accurate, because really, I'm about making an editor which is fun for me to use, and hopefully for some other people, too, but I mean, honestly, it's for me. <laughs> and it is a structure editor, and I mean, I talked a little bit about what that meant before, but in case, in case you've forgotten, I've, well, I'll let you read. Um, 
So what's wrong with current editors? I'm gonna talk about a few of the, the little things that I feel that I have addressed or am addressing uh, with what I showed you. I feel that text-based layout encourages needless fiddling with code formatting. I mean, this might be a me problem, but I find that when I can change a lot of things that don't really matter, I tend to, and then I tend to change them back and forth and back and forth. And also language syntax. I would like to make a lot of language syntax choices a matter of projection. So you, you've got the underlying AST structure and how it looks and even how you interact with it on a typing basis can be a matter that is abstracted from that. Uh, Operating on non-meaningful selections breaks things. Mostly this is solved in, in things like Emacs and to a lesser degree, Dr. Racket with, with, with existing structured editing plugins like Power Edit, Power Infer, and Smart Parens. But those to me are, are structured editors specifically for S expressions. And I want to kind of move up the grammar hierarchy a bit and make things that yeah, aren't just concerned with, I mean S expressions are some intermediary level, if you will, between text and, and full language grammars, and I wanna, I, I wanna push that up. I mean, as much as you want to in, in your particular language. Um, there's, yeah, complex non-semantic motor planning, need it for destructuring and restructuring existing code. I mean, I was at the Racket School, and I mean, watching some of these guys do live coding and Dr. Racket was absolutely stunning. I mean, so many people don't even use parentheses autocomplete, but for the rest of us who are perhaps less coordinated, I like the idea of just painting on code, then turning it into what you wanna turn it into. Uh, implicit editor state is a big one for me. Like I could have just stuck those components of those ifs in, in, in a register or a ring, but I never remember what's there. Like just put it on the screen, paint it colors. Keyboard shortcuts, often arbitrary. This is probably harder to appreciate, but I encourage you to play around with it because I think a lot of these spatial keyboard shortcuts like back and forth in transformation mode for undo redo are actually quite compelling. And again, the refactoring point. It's, I, I think that refactoring needs to be much more front and center in editors because so much of what we do is restructuring existing code rather than writing new code. Uh, so in general, I think my issue is that I feel object languages and editor concepts live in different worlds and Fructure is an attempt to push these things together a bit. So my way forward here is an editor that strictly generalizes text-based input a lot of people working in this space, and there's a lot of people working in structured editing, uh, visual programming, there's a whole bunch of different subterms here, projectional editing, syntax directed editing. People tend to invent their own language, and I mean, obviously we like people who invent their own language, but I would like to see a structured editor which does not even accidentally invent its own language, um, or if I do end up creating a language for this, it'll be for creating structured editors, not like, oh, you have to use this language if you wanna use my structure editor. So basically, what I'm trying to do is bridge the gap between text and richer structures. And I feel, yeah, th 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 this is important because a lot of people will rant about how bad text is, and I, I disagree. If you don't appreciate text, although I doubt very many people here fall into that category, try and make a post-text editor and you'll, you'll, you'll go running back because text is incredible in so many ways. Uh, so theory, there is some theory here. Uh, my general model, is, I, I call it transformation-based editing. I mean, all editing is to some degree transformation-based, but all of my edits are basically uh, meaningful whole program transformations as defined through term rewriting. I have in the background a global list of transformations, and when you click on that transform mode, it looks at what's under the cursor and filters that list accordingly. Now, insertion happens via grammatical production rules. So to add a bunch of forms to the language, you'd basically add a bunch of these rules that take a whole to the various syntactic forms of your language. And simple refactorings are specified similarly. You have a cond with some pattern variables in it, taking it to an if or vice versa. Uh, my backend is an editor state. Uh, like the editor state itself is an abstract syntax tree, which is uh, augmented with a bunch of attributes. If I had done this after this week, I would have used syntax objects and been able to leverage a lot of the language-oriented programming features already in Racket, and I mean, I'm hoping to rebuild to use a lot of these things now that I understand them better, but right now it's very ad hoc. Uh, I'm gonna skip over a little bit of this, but uh, I'm gonna talk about, so my general approach with editing is something that I call syntactic affordances, and the idea here is that you take a lot of things that are, are basically editor level concepts and you write them into the tree, like the holes are an example, the cursor, the selector, it's not some indirect thing, it's actually an object I write into the tree itself. So my editor actions, like moving the tree, uh, moving the cursor around the tree, are term rewriting rules, just like, uh, just like things like turning the cond into an if, all of these exist at a common conceptual level. 
uh, oh yeah, I'll, I'll mention this middle point, turning informal editing tactics into editor concepts. Like, a lot of people have dealt with holes. Like, you'll see these whole things in proof assistance, but the first time I was introduced to them, it was things like live coding in class. Like, people put in question marks for things they want to fill in. I want to look at what people are doing, the way people are actually programming, and take these concepts and turn them into first-class entities in the editor to enable a lot of other people to use them as well, and maybe use them more effectively. Um, so my emphasis with structure is not on formality as such, like uh, there, is, there is some theory behind it in, in, in a fairly loose way. There are other people, Cyrus Omar in particular is working on something called Hazel and he's taking a very formal approach where he's developing an editor calculus based on actions which preserve well typedness. It's pretty cool, but yeah, I, I, I'm more interested in building user interface features to support this kind of thing and to make them more directly accessible and usable to you, the end users, rather than formalism as such. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip over a little bit of this here. Uh, term rewriting, most of you know a lot about term rewriting, I think. If you don't, take a look at my slides. They're already on my GitHub. There's some very interesting stuff there. I mean, it, it, it's term rewriting is used both for language implementation in some cases and, and also just for explanation, like Dr. Rackett's algebraic step is a great example, though apparently in our next talk we're going to find out that uh, they're moving away from using simple reduction rules, so I'm, I'm very curious as to what the direction is there. Um, but in general, we talk about term rewriting at runtime and compile time, and I want us to talk about term rewriting at edit time, which is not an entirely unexplored topic. Like I said, Cyrus Omar is doing it, and there's a few other people who are starting to look at it, but it, it, it's a largely fresh area. Um, let's go, I'm gonna show you a little bit of the code, uh, not really a lot. So holes, I mentioned them earlier. This is just, yeah, that's holes as they looked on the screen. The blue version is as they look in the code. I've been using Unicode characters to represent a lot of this stuff. So this is the way the if form works internally. It's that dot, dot, dot up there is basically a syntactic shorthand I've implemented to indicate that, yeah, uh, everything on the left-hand side of the arrow is what we're looking for in the code, and everything on the right-hand side is what we're gonna replace that thing with. The yellow thing there is the hole, and you notice that the cursor is there too. So this, this rule actually yet yeah, incorporates the state of the cursor as well as the, the state of the syntax. And this indicates that we, if we have a hole of sort expression, we can replace it with an if, which also has sort expression, and it's got some holes in it. This rule also moves the cursor to the third uh, argument or the third, uh, the third part of the if, like that's just something that I showed. You basically can do that. You can do cursor movement via these transformation rules. I want to redo all this stuff using syntax objects because they'd probably be, well, more syntactically straightforward. Uh, Lambda is basically the same thing, a little bit more sophisticated there. Um, how do I fracturize my lang? Right now, you basically need to write a whole bunch of those rules, but in principle, this should all be free. Like, there should be enough information in the macros that define your lang to populate these rules and even some of the simple refactorings automatically. I don't know whether it's actually tractable in any reasonable way to get this out of the existing code, but I think for certain simple cases it is, and I'd be very happy to talk to anybody who has notions about the plausibility of, of this approach in general. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how selectors are implemented. And uh, yeah, my first take on structural navigation was basically this. These are some fairly prosaic uh, kind of pattern match pairs here. The first example is you got this whole list selected. This is a rule that moves the selector to the first child. The second one is moves the selector from a child to a parent. The next one basically wraps around to the next sibling. This is kind of a cool toy model. You can make a very simple structure editor very easily just using match in this way, but it's not really scalable. Like, it's, you know, I was moving my cursor in a tree traversal, and this is, this is tough to do, right? Like, you need to come up with like either an infinite amount of cases to escape from deeply nested context, or you need to move to something more interesting. And what I ended up doing is moving to this, uh, the, 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 this pattern matcher that I implemented, uh, which I call containment patterns. It's the, the diagonal dot, dot, dot there, which is implemented separately. And you can do fairly sophisticated stuff with this. I'm not expecting you to read and understand what's up here. Like, this is actually maybe showing a limitation of my approach, but this part of the code is actually doing something I, I find somewhat, it's interesting that you can do it with just a single pattern match pair. It's basically moving uh, the cursor up to the nearest containing handle. Handles, those little, those other white things you see there are something I write into the code, and they determine what is and is not selectable, because you might want at certain points certain parts of the code to be selectable and certain other parts not to be. Handles will do that for you. Of course, moving it up to the nearest containing handle is, is a slightly ambiguous, well, it's not an ambiguous thing, but it's a complicated thing, which is why there's a little bit more code here than you might otherwise expect. 
Uh, so briefly, thoughts and plans for the future. There's a lot that I want to do with this. You've seen like the barest sliver of what I want to accomplish. The biggest issue that needs to be addressed, and this is the biggest issue I think with structural editing in general, is what if syntax errors are actually good? And the thing is, this is the case. Syntax errors are actually good, at least in, in, in a very specific context, because sometimes the fastest path to a good state is through bad ones. Now, <laughs> my general goal here is to make new editing modes which take different ways that people want their syntax to be temporarily invalid and turn that into very, some very specific construct to maintain some kinds of well formedness if not on an immediate basis over time. I've got this term like eventual correctness here for you might want to in temporarily introduce a variable that's not in scope or when you might want to edit from the bottom up. This is one interesting thing I'm working on now, a, a mode that's designed from the bottom up for bottom up editing as opposed to top down as you saw earlier. As I mentioned, I want to leverage the racket language ecosystem. I want to move to using syntax objects and maybe even using syntax parse to, to rewrite this stuff at, at, at runtime. Um, for a while, I was under the impression that I could only use it at compile time, but I mean, it's just data like everything else, so I think that, that, that it should be workable. And uh, yeah, there's some other stuff that if you're interested, definitely talk to me after because I've got yeah, endless thoughts here. Um, related work, take a look at my slides. There's so many in interesting people doing interesting work in this area. I feel that, 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 that they're trying to, to run before we've walked with structural editing and there's fundamental UI issues to deal with, but all of this amazing stuff, especially I want to call out Cyrus Omar, not call out, but uh, say, yeah, look at his stuff. Uh, Leif Anderson, uh, who gave a talk uh, 2017 about video lang, her uh, embedded editor for videos in Dr. Act looks absolutely amazing. I don't know what's been done on that recently, but in general, that, 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 that is the thing. What I want to see in the future is, is, is a whole stack of embedded special purpose editors uh, for, 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 for everything, essentially. Um, and I want to give a thanks to Gary Baumgartner. He's a professor at the University of Toronto. I don't know whether he's on the radar of many of the people that are part of the Racket community. He tends to fly under the radar. He's a teaching stream professor who's done a lot of very interesting stuff with Racket. And I'm putting his name up for a while here to try and shame him to making some of his stuff web-facing so you guys can see the cool stuff he's been doing for years. Gary. And uh, yeah, that's it. Questions, if we have time? Was I right? <laughs> Where do I sign the PhD form? Uh. This is, uh, let me pre have a prelude. Uh, Big Bang is for beginners. <laughs> I'm a beginner. There are more. <laughs> I would like more beginners like you. Okay, here's the question. So when I first started to program in Scheme 84, I was using a text-based structure editor, which came from the Lisp and Interlisp community. It was just built into the REPL, fantastic stuff, cool. until you hit the limitations. Then Team Teitelbaum came around and did more graphical things, which you're probably aware of. And again, it failed for the reasons you alluded to in your last slide. Yeah. And you clearly seem to have ideas on how to go through this bad path between two good states because the bad path is the faster one. Yes. I'll give you one small example, and I want, I'm interested in your response. Suppose I need a local CP, I need a function, and you have it locally CPSed. All right. That's a good, th this is clearly an example where you want shortcuts through, uh, take a bad path from one good state, the direct version of the function, to the CPS version of the function yeah. because you want to have some interrupts going on, right? How, how do you imagine doing that in a structure editor setting? I think we're going to have to take that one offline. I do know continuation passing style, but I think that that's a little bit much for me to try and work through in front of you here. Sim, I continue off of that. I was wondering if you'd looked at the text-based structural editing uh, that's out there today, like Emacs's ParEdit. Oh yeah, I mean, I've played with all of those. Like, actually, I'm a relative like newcomer to, to Emacs. I've just been using it for the last three months for programming and closure. Eventually, I'll probably move over for Rocket. Like, all that stuff is, is is super cool. And I mean, I think eventually I'll get a set of key bindings that if I had had originally, maybe I would not have embarked on this endeavor. But <laughs> I feel that out of the box, there there's certain aspects of the experience which is not are not, are not fully 
compelling. I mean, even just doing the basic kind of tree traversal thing, at least like what I've seen, I mean, it's mostly just what I've learned kind of through other people. It's still, most people, they don't do full structured editing. Like they will use some of the structured editing key bindings, but then use, I mean, just back and forth words. I mean, what does a word mean? I mean, to me, often the word thing will bring me a character away from, from, from what I want. I, I just feel that, that as long as what we're dealing with is fundamentally text, there will be this degree of leakiness to it. Now that said, part of this presentation is kind of a, a troll post, so if anybody feels they have the perfect Emacs profile that solves everything that I've been worrying about, well, show me and I'll, you know, that's, that's it. We're, we're done. <laughs> I don't know, did that address your question? Oh, interesting. Um, and it's something you might want to look at as far as like Mozilla. Like right. Structuring a form and, and puking it into the parent. Right. Is one thing that can be syntactically wrong. I mean, one of the first things I did with this was just implement like basic like uh, barf and slurp and all of the, the par edit, e edit modes. And I mean, delicate, like the, the way that I think about, about grammars is languages don't have like a single grammar as such, rather there's, there's a grammar hierarchy. I mean, you've got like your, your text stream, you've got S expressions, you've got something that uh, is, you know, using the proper identifiers, maybe not in the, in the proper scopes. And then if your language has types, that's, I mean, calling that a grammar is a bit of a stretch, but you've got this kind of hierarchy of correctness. And one thing that I want to implement is this, like this is basically my, my nuclear option for bad syntax uh, is escape hatches where you can basically insert this, it's similar to if you know Cyrus Omar's uh, non-empty holes, like his way of dealing with code that is for a, temporarily, a temporary uh, period ill-typed is, is to stick it inside a hole and that hole is, is protected from, from, from type checking essentially. So what I'd like to do is you, you have escape hatches to move down from the full like, extent of your grammar into just S expressions or even into just text. Now this, like I said, is a nuclear option that I'm going to leave in because I think that programmers should be able to basically type in whatever they want. I don't think people are gonna use this if you can't, but yeah, the more esoteric versions that I'm talking about. Okay, Gary, uh, Gary is watching the live stream, Gary Baumgartner, and he's just, yeah, that's him right there. Hey, Gary. If you wanna talk more about that, let's talk offline, though, for sure. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, everybody.